Okay, volume rendering. This is the uh, first of the four renderers that I'm going to be going over in our tutorial session on YouTube, I guess. Um, here we can see I have the vapor window open, and this is kind of how it appears when you start up the application. Um, the default tab uh, that we are assigned when we open is the DVR, which is the one we're starting with. Um, to the left of the DVR, you can see some of the other renderers. Um, I'll be going over a few of them, like uh, Flow, ISO surfaces, and the Probe in the upcoming YouTube videos, but there are other ones that I'll probably get to later, uh, 2D, Contours, Region, and there's a few others on the left. But for today, um, I'm starting off with DVR. So, now that we've opened up the application, we can see our DVR panel and its settings. Um, that are going to control the, the volume that we draw in our renderer. Um, up and we can, we can scroll down and see some of the other tools that we'll go through. Uh, now that we're in the DVR renderer uh, tab, we need to load a data set, which is uh, kind of imperative for uh, rendering data. So to do that, I'm going to click on uh, the data tab, and there are two ways to load data into Vapor. Uh, one is to directly import the data, and we support uh, several file formats for direct data importation, uh, WERF, MOM, uh, ROMs, POP, CAM, and some GRIB files. Um, today I'm just going to be directly importing my WERF data, but the second way to load data into Vapor is to convert it into Vapor's uh, VDC file format, which is great if your data is big. Um, it has a a compression algorithm that's applied that allows you to uh, render the data at a compressed level so you don't slow down your computer um, because sometimes the renderings can get computationally expensive so uh, today <clears throat> again we're just going to directly import WERF ARW model data of Hurricane Katrina so I'm going to click on that navigate to my data directory and select my four WERF files that I'm going to volume render with. Um, these files are available on the Vapor website, and I'll be putting a link at the bottom of the video in case you guys want to download them and experiment or uh, follow along with what I'm doing. So I selected those. I'm going to open them. And the first thing we see in our rendering frame is this square uh, domain. It kind of represents the area on, or I guess within our model that uh, our computation was done. So I guess the first thing I'll show you guys is if you um, right click, I'm sorry, if you left click on the scene, you can spin it around and kind of change your orientation. Um, if you right click, you can zoom out and zoom in. And the middle mouse button lets you transpose your viewpoint. So with those three mouse buttons you can kind of get to the region um, that has a feature you want to show or just get a better aesthetic angle on uh, your model. Um, <clears throat> one of the first things you'll note is that our z-axis is very small compared to our x and our y-axis. Um, of course because the atmosphere is thin compared to the latitude and longitude of uh, typical study areas. Um, I guess mostly with climate models that's true, with the smaller weather models uh, it's not as big of an issue. But to compensate for this small z-axis and to get a really good 3D uh, representation of our data, we're going to have to stretch it. And so the first thing we typically do is go up here to our edit menu and we click on edit visualizer features. That's going to bring up a whole list of uh, different, um, I guess, objects and items that we can add into our 3D scene um, as well as a few um, options to edit settings. What we're looking for is our scene stretch factors. It's the first thing we see right up here at the top and it has three fields for X, Y, and Z. We can stretch any of them but we're just going to do Z by a factor of 25. <clears throat> I'm going to apply it and we can see that our rendering kind of jumped. Um, so what I'm going to do is close my visualizer feature selection window and sometimes in Vapor it's uh, 
it's possible for the user to get lost. We're not sure where we wound up, where we flew through space, and um, <laughs> you can navigate through the scene, which will cause errors and cause other problems. So if that ever happens, click through the error messages and click the home icon. Uh, up here above the visualizer. So you can click the home icon and that'll bring you back to the starting point and you can start fresh. So I guess I'll just show that a few more times. You can change your angle and then go back home. So now that we see our kind of like the, the cube of our domain, uh, I guess it'd be a good time to render something into it. So over here in our DVR panel, we have, um, I guess, an instance that's described here of our renderer. Um, some renderers can have multiple instances. DVR is kind of unique. You can only have one. So um, we'll have to, or you can only be rendering one at a time. If you want to have more than one, you can of course make a new one and edit its settings and render that one or disable it and enable your other one. But um, just keep in mind you can only have one DVR on at a time. I'm just going to be dealing with one. So I'm going to click on my second instance, delete it, and enable my first. The first thing we see is this kind of rainbow pattern. Um, this is our elevation variable, which we can see demonstrated right here in this little drop-down menu. Elevation right there. And um, it's distributed in color by this object down here called the transfer function. So I want to spend a bit of time talking about this transfer function because it's a common theme in Vapor and it's really how we apply any color to our objects that we render in the scene. Um, before we go into our transfer function though, I'm going to change the variable to something more interesting um, like Q cloud. Select that and now we have a representation of cloud, but it's not the one we want to go for. The color is not really being distributed to its different values in a meaningful way. It's all blue. So we're going to come down here to our transfer function. And this is what's going to allow us to apply color. Um, basically, the transfer function, uh, which is this, this uh, black window right here, it represents a histogram of the data which is kind of hard to see right now. Um, I'm going to tweak something real quick just for demonstration purposes. What I did there is I hit these three buttons, fit data, fit to view, and histogram. And that kind of, um, it, it re-rendered um, my scene and it also regenerated my transfer function histogram, our, our key coloring component. Uh, so what the transfer function is, is it's kind of a, it's a mass distribution of our variable within our region of interest. So um, you can kind of see with our QCloud variable, there's a lot of va uh, values of this variable here on the left side and fewer at the tail as we go down to the right. The color is applied to this mass function um, below its uh, its represented values, if, if that makes any sense. So most of the values here on the left are being colored red, and the ones to the right are being colored into yellow. Um, there are values in the histogram to the right. We just can't see them right now because the, uh, I guess the mass of those variables is less than um, would be represented by one pixel on our map right here. I hope, I hope that makes sense, but basically there are values over here that are just not massive enough to be represented by a pixel, so they don't even show up. So what we can do is right-click on our transfer function and edit our histogram scaling, make it logarithmic, and here we can see that there are values if our y-axis is represented logarithmically. Uh, but for most purposes, I typically use linear histogram scaling. Um, I don't know, there are exceptions, but most often I use linear. Um, so, okay, on the right, 
<clears throat> we see our DVR, our volume representation of the cloud variable. Um, and one, one thing that um, Vapor allows you to do uh, in order to change the colors of the volume is to manipulate two things. There is the color bar down here at the bottom, and you can also manipulate the opacity right here with the green bar. Um, the opacity is very important because if, um, if you don't make some variable or values in the variable transparent, then uh, the picture is just cluttered. So if, if, for example, we have the red values over here, lots of mass with them, we can make all the red values uh, much more opaque make them, because they're mostly transparent right now. If we make them opaque like this, then it's just a red scene and there's no real information uh, that's conveyed. So um, basically how we manipulate our opacity values is with this diagonal bar that goes across the line. There's a square box at a few points along it and you can take those boxes and drag them down or up. And that will uh, manipulate how um, the transparency is applied to the values at that point in that diagonal line. So I guess um, what I would be doing if I dragged this box all the way down like so is that all the values here on the right are being displayed at maximum opacity while all the values here on the left side of our transfer function are being uh, completely cleared out. They're, they're totally transparent because this line has been dragged all the way down to zero. So um, with that being said, the other way to uh, edit the transfer function through color is with the color bar down here. And uh, you can see these little widgets down at the bottom they control um, how the color is distributed along the bottom. So if I took this green one and dragged it left, we'd be applying green to the colors above it in the histogram. Um, same with blue or any other color along the bar. For QCloud, um, I don't think that RGB and violet really uh, give the best representation for humidity or cloud. So uh, one thing that you can do is down here, there is this load installed transfer function, load installed TF button. You can click on that, and then we'll be presented with a whole range of different transfer function color palettes. Instead of just um, the default RGB violet, we can pick something like grayscale for cloud. Double click on that, and we can see the colors have changed uh, down here on our transfer function from black at the low values and the most populous values to white at the high end. Um, you can also customize your transfer functions um, in more ways than just dragging around the widgets for opacity and uh, color. Uh, you can also edit the colors at either um, end or at the widgets of the transfer function. So what I'm going to do is since I kind of feel like clouds get darker as they're more moist, I'm going to apply the dark colors to the high values in humidity and the light colors to the low values in humidity. Um, and so just switch the colors uh, as they are right now from black to white to white to black. To do that, I will right click on my widget. I will click edit control point. And to change this widget to black, I'm going to select black. Now they're both black, but now I'm going to go over to the left one, edit control black or control point, and change it to white. So a lot of um, using the transfer function is just playing with it. In my opinion, um, it takes time to get the right aesthetic, and so. Um, Basically, what I typically end up doing is just adding a few 
color control points. I can I can right click on the color control point bar, click new color control point, and I'll add another control point here. I'm just gonna kind of squish them together, and um, that's kind of hard to I guess notice. It's subtle if you look at the renderer though. I can take this control point, move it over and apply a darker color to more of the uh, histogram. So it's a subtle difference. Um, not sure if that's coming through on YouTube. But after playing with the transfer function earlier today, I think I found that I liked something along these lines, I guess more dark about halfway through it. Uh, something, something like that for my cloud variable. We can move it around and I guess we can always click on the home key to bring us back home and kind of get a top-down view of what the hurricane looks like. And spin it around. But one thing that I'm noticing with this rendering is that there's a lot going on at the top and there's stuff going on that I really care more about at the bottom. There's some interesting structure down here. So one thing I can do in the volume renderer, in any renderer for uh, that matter, is I can, with my mouse, go up to the top left where it says navigation up here, and I can select on um, these different renderers uh, to edit the region that they're being drawn in. So for the DVR, I select the region mode like this, and then I get these uh, this series of red boxes that let me uh, right click on them and kind of drag them around to render different parts of the scene and kind of isolate them. So in order to get rid of this, this, this top clutter in the hurricane, I'm going to try dragging this down a little bit and see if that makes it a little more clear deeper down into the hurricane. So I think that did the trick. Click on my home icon to bring me home and go back to my mode and select navigation to make those red boxes go away and zoom in a little bit on my hurricane. Bring it around. And um, one thing to note is at the beginning when I loaded my files, I loaded four separate files. Um, those are each a time step in the simulation series. And so now that I've got the transfer function that I like more or less, I can go ahead and with these buttons up here at the top, I can play through the time steps in the series. So I can play them in reverse and forward. And again, this, this is a it can be computationally intensive depending on what you're doing with your volume renderer or your other renderer. So um, I guess that's just one more reason why converting your data sets so that they can be compressed and analyzed at different compression levels is a good thing. Um, because, I don't know, some computers are faster than others and some are slower than others. Um, and the time of rendering can vary depending on your hardware. Okay, so those are the basics of the volume renderer. In the next video, I'm going to be going over isosurfaces, a similar concept, but different.